This episode is brought to you by Moo, the place to get delightfully premium business cards, postcards, mini cards, flyers, stickers, greeting cards, and so much more. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. This is the place where we expose the threads of heroism that stitch together the stories we admire most. As a musician, singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and business owner, I encounter some really fascinating stories. Every episode you'll hear features a revealing conversation with someone who courageously pours themselves out into the world. We'll talk about fears befriended, the terrors battled, and the courage created along our stories of bravery, quiet heroism, and all-out gutsiness. We open the Pandora's box of the dream-crushing constraints we all face during significant moments of bravery. These moments of bare-naked bravery are rarely censored in real life, so if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. The questions I ask today aren't scripted because I'm just curious. What is bravery? My hope for us all is that by listening to others search for and find their bravery, we will find our own. For that is what we need most, to know that we are not alone. The best way you can support the show is to share it with a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle's Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Bottom line, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Maria Doyle is another one of our Australian listeners and now guest on the show. She is such a blast and has such an innate sense of adventure. I really loved getting to know her better through this conversation. Maria helps passionate professionals systemize, optimize, and digitalize their expertise. And basically that just means she helps people do what they do and get it online in a really awesome way. In doing so, she also helps to create quality learning experiences that engage, inspire, and motivate her clients' clients to create real change. And it is her life mission to take the last luster courses, workshops, and presentations of the world, both the virtual and the in-person ones, and transform them into the it changed my life kind of experiences. I think you'll pick that up in her conversation. She's really good at it. She also has a ton of experience and expertise in being brave within her own career. And you'll see that as her creative entrepreneurship unfolds in this conversation. Because I know she loves storytelling, I know you will love Maria Doyle. Let's jump on in. Maria, I am so glad you're here with us. I really am. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Emily. So you and I are in a Facebook group and I feel like a little black sheep in that Facebook group because it's mostly Australian ladies (laughs) in this Facebook group. And here I am. (laughs) Oh, it's awesome. It's so amazing. (laughs) But it's so great for me to eavesdrop in on this entirely different cultural pocket of really badass ladies doing what they love. And I'm really grateful that you're here today. So let's start with this. What was the most recent brave thing you've done in your career? In my career? Yeah. Probably going out on my own, probably stepping away from the professional, academic, corporate world and going out on my own. I had a lot of fear around doing that. I didn't want to be seen as a cowboy. I didn't want to be seen as some online charlatan or someone that couldn't make it work in the corporate world or someone who couldn't quite get to the top end of the academic ladder or, you know, someone who, I guess in our industry in teaching and and academia, you sort of, you take two roads. You either do a PhD and get steeped in research 
or you go down the teaching road or often you, you do both of those things, but you stay in that very academic world within universities or colleges or wherever it is that you are working. I came from an English teaching background, so a teacher training, curriculum development, English teaching background. And so walking away from that world was even harder, I guess, in that my life was this constant travelling from country to country, taking new jobs, working on new projects. I ended up working with the Australian government on some large education projects. So, you know, it takes a long time to get the qualifications and the experience to get accepted into projects like that. Most of the managers, I was a manager in that project, a senior manager, and the other senior managers were a good 20, 30 years my senior. So, you know, it was hard work to get there and then to walk away from all of that was brave, really brave. What did it feel like the week before you left? Or I should say the week before you decided to leave? Well, it was sort of a gradual, it wasn't really it wasn't really a decision. I was on this job out in the Pacific for two and a half years. I was actually on two jobs out there, but anyway, for simplicity's sake, I was out there for two and a half years and about two years into it, my body just gave out and I had a lot of issues. Long story short, it was, it was multiple organ failure. My heart wasn't working. My lungs weren't working properly. I couldn't breathe properly. I was passing out if I got up over 45 degree angle. So I had to get out quickly and medical treatment. No one knew what was wrong. It was this mystery illness and it just It was lingering. They ended up telling me I needed to go to a psychiatrist. And I was vehemently opposed to that. I knew there was something wrong. And I ended up getting it diagnosed. I was riddled with parasites. And they weren't picking that up on any Western medicine tests. So crazy, crazy sort of period of my life to live through where everyone was saying, you're crazy. There's nothing wrong with you. It was. There was something seriously wrong. And I got to the bottom of it and worked it out. And I've never been so relieved in my my life. (laughs) To be told there was a physical reason for, for why I was so ill. You know, that, that really changes your perspective on what's important. And I was working out on this aid development project. It was out in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful, beautiful country. I love the people. I love the culture. It was so removed from the developed world. There was very little connection to the outside world, very little media, no magazines, no real department stores or no real shop. I mean, there were shops, but, you know, not like we know them. There was no real internet connection or sort of connection to mainstream media or any of that sort of thing. And so you come back sort of almost a bit assaulted by what we have in the developed world and the way people live because over there it's all very much like, oh, well, you know, you just leave a coconut will fall tomorrow and there'll be another fish in the ocean. And that really is all that matters. There'll be, there'll be coconut, there'll be fish. I mean, the place is <laughs> under environmental threat, so they may actually all be having to leave their island, so there may not be any more coconuts falling but anyway that's the culture and to live in that culture is just beautiful and you working for an Australian company obviously you're against Australian timelines and workflow but coming back into Australia and going oh my goodness like that is how good life can be that is how calm and uncomplicated life can be and I come back and I'm assaulted with every time I come back from the state like after having a foreign experience of it pretty much any kind it happened when I came back from Burning Man it also happened when I came back from Turkey and France you get to you walk into the grocery store to get like one really simple thing probably toothpaste walk into the toothpaste aisle and in the U.S. there is a whole aisle dedicated to toothpaste and it is so overwhelming to walk in and just go, I just need one tube of toothpaste. Don't need all of this. That was me with cheese. I <laughs> went in with my sister to the shops to get cheese crackers and a bottle of wine. And she said, you go choose the cheese because I know you haven't had cheese for a while. I'll go get the crackers. And I stood in front of the cheese aisle and was just like, are you nuts? Like we were in Kiribati. If cheese came in, there was this like Mayday, Mayday SOS call that went right around the island. There's cheese, there's cheese. And so we'd all like fly down the supermarket and get this like, you know, one block, this the kilo blocks of mainland cheddar, you know, really sort of, gosh, stodgy cheese. <laughs> and here I am in this wall of cheese. I'm like, why do we need eight different types of camembert? Like I don't get it. Like I just sat there and she kind of, she looked at me, she goes, have you chose one yet? I just looked at her and said, no. Nah. And I gave her my wallet and said, just make a decision. I can't do this. <laughs> so yeah, we've all, we've all got our supermarket story, haven't we? But yeah, no, it wasn't a decision to leave. It was just a gradual realization that I couldn't go back to the life that I'd lived. I think being that ill and coming so close to or not knowing what was going on, you know, having been in full seizures, having seizures in the middle of 
an isolated atoll where you are at least three hours from a proper island that actually has a hospital and doctors and equipment. You know, that was, and that's a three hour commercial flight. You know, you, you, you really, it really makes you question what you're doing. Like, why am I doing this? Where is my life going? You know, how am I living? So my options were to continue getting overseas teaching gigs, which after 20 years, you know, you sort of get a bit over it. I mean, I've had a ball. I've had 12 overseas postings. I've traveled through 35 countries. I've what were, what were some of your favorites or what were some like highlights? Kiribati definitely like out in the Pacific where, where I nearly died <laughs> was definitely, I mean, one of the closest scrapes with death I've had. I've had, not that that means fun, but you know what I mean? Like the best experiences. People ask that and it's such a difficult question to answer. I mean, Japan, I lived in Japan for nearly two years. Oh, just loved that experience for you so many know something really random this weekend i spent about an hour watching somehow you get on these youtube vortexes right yeah it just sucks you in and you've like wasted an hour doing something yeah. that you really didn't intend to do i watched tours of youtubers giving a little tour of their miniature apartments in japan oh so like the you know <laughs> Yeah, mine was crazy. I could stand in the middle of my apartment and touch every wall. <laughs> I could I could stir whatever was on the kitchen stove from the toilet. <laughs> out of control, like out of control. It was so, and I was really cold. Like I was up in the mountains. So basically if I opened a cupboard door, then the wind would whistle through. It was out of control. It was insane. But yeah, I mean, look, yeah, so many different experiences. Whenever someone says, what was your best? And I'm like, oh, don't ask that. Like, it's such a hard question. They were all different. They were all with different people. They were all at different ages. I mean, you, as a teacher, you experience and witness, especially because you're now you're teaching other teachers and oh. you're instructing yeah. other teachers how to teach. Mm -hmm. So... What have been some of the bravest moments that you've witnessed your students take on? I think because most of my students are in a situation where they are, their first language isn't the language that I'm trying to teach them. <laughs> so that takes a lot of bravery to continually try and get your opinion across or try and negotiate a discussion or negotiate some circumstances when English isn't your first language. I don't know whether you've learned other languages or not, but when you're speaking in a language that is not your first, especially when you're not proficient, you, you feel like an idiot. You know, in your language, you're articulate, you're intelligent, you can, you know, you can argue a situation in another language, like, uh, 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 you can't get your words out, you can't fight like you'd fight, you know, you oh, can't. you're stripped of your humour. Totally, you're totally stripped of everything. You, I mean, if, and that's if you can communicate at, at a certain level, if you can communicate at a, like an intermediate level at least. So, I mean, students standing up in front of the class and giving presentations, when you think about in your own language, are you happy to stand up in front of a bunch of people you don't know and give a presentation? No, not, probably not. Imagine doing that in a language that is not your own and that you are really not very confident in. So that ability to stand up and to just let it all sort of wash off. I mean, I remember having presentation skills classes, so whole classes of people, and our job was to get them in 10 weeks to be giving presentations and writing academic reports based on, you know, academic research. And these people are people who, in their own country, they don't have academic rigour to the same level that we do. So in Australia, you have to research your assignments, have your quotes, be able to and obviously not plagiarise. So you're paraphrasing, you're summarising, all these sort of academic skills. In their country, they just literally take chunks out verbatim and, and that is their research. They just literally submit other people's research as their own. So to have to learn all those skills and then to be in the classroom and being told, well, this is what you're doing is plagiarism. You're stealing other people's ideas and they're looking at you and going, what? No, that's what we do in our country. We just research and we show our teacher what we found. It's like, <laughs> you know, in Australia, you have to summarise, you have to paraphrase, you can't plagiarise. And so, you know, looking at these poor kids going, you're accusing me of stealing? You're accusing me of committing a crime? Like what? Like, no, this is bravery. You want bravery? These kids having to stand up and, and A, fight all their cultural background and then B, get the balls, sorry, horrible expression, but get the balls to stand up and in front of a group of people that they don't know and then fight for something when in their own culture they don't even know how to create an argument because they're told what to argue for. They're not given the skills to create the argument and then to defend it. So, yeah, extreme bravery. I mean, I had a kid from Iraq 
he was one of the chemical engineers in working for a large engineering company. And he was basically sent to Australia because if he stayed where he was, he was going to get killed because he was working with an American company. So they put him in Australia for a little while because, you know, that's sort of the safest place for him to be. And he was out there trying to learn English in about six months so that he could get accepted into a master's program. Because if he didn't, he was going to get sent home and he'd be killed. <laughs> I'm sitting there as the teacher going, he can't string a word together and you want him to go and do a master's? Like, are you serious? And so in these six months, I had to literally, he tried so hard. You want bravery? My God, this kid went from not being able to produce a sentence. Three years later, he called me or emailed me or found me on Facebook and said, please come to my graduation ceremony. He got it. Oh. And I was like, dude, seriously. And his English was like, hey, hey, going? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> he just, yeah. I, I don't know. I've just never seen language acquisition so fast, but yeah, I tell you when there's motivation there. So yeah, he's married now and kids and he's got a beautiful family and he's out here and kudos to him. He's, he did have to go back for a little while, but he got his wife and he came back out and they started a life here. So yeah, talk about bravery. Woo. Wow. Yeah. Huge. Wow. Okay. So you, are we allowed to talk about blackmail? Yeah, we can talk about blackmail. Let's, okay. Because <laughs> Because something that I have noticed across the board in most of these stories about bravery is, mm. especially your student, there's some element of lack of choice. Mm. There's some uncontrollable element in life or money or time or government or whatever that we have no choice but to be brave. Mm. And I think blackmail qualifies for that. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a convoluted story and I'll try and sort of summarize it. I think I've, I think I've gotten pretty good at summarizing it over the years. Basically I was working for a company in abroad. I don't, I don't know that I want to be too specific on uh, exactly where or how. Surely it can't come back to bite me in the ass, but it, this, it happened. I mean, this was my first teaching job overseas I was very naive, but, you know, young, 21, had really enjoyed studying in another city where I was evacuated because civil unrest. So the whole, basically the whole government exploded. And now, yeah, now you want a story on bravery. That is a story on bravery. I basically came head first into this riot. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> blackmail, back to blackmail. So I really wanted to get back to this country because I'd studied the language and I really wanted to be close to the people and the culture because it really meant a lot to me and I really wanted to expand that side of me. So I took this English teaching job and it was for a reputable company with, you know, there was a chain school, so there was lots of them, but really it's like any franchise, it depends on who's managing them. We were working there for, I think, about six months and then my boss got really sick and we were very good friends. So me and my boss and his girlfriend, the three of us were like a bit of a set, like we just, we did everything together, we were very close and he got very sick. Long story short, he had a condition. He had this local tropical disease that no one could diagnose until later on. We worked out what the problem was, but anyway, it was too late by that point. He got medevaced out with his girlfriend back to Australia and they decided not to go back. They decided not to go back to this post where we were teaching. So my boss called me into the office and was like, you knew that they were leaving. You helped clear out their house. And I was like, whoa, what are you talking about? Like, I only found out last night. I have no idea. They'd gotten other friends to go into the house and clear out all of their luggage and belongings and send them back to their own countries before they told the boss because they knew what the boss was like and there was a fair chance it was going to get pear-shaped. So, and it did for me, get very pear-shaped. So he basically, he needed a, a scapegoat. He needed someone to get angry at. So I was it. So I went from teaching, you know, regular sort of nine to five type days to first class in the morning right through to last class in the evening no break all day Saturday and then testing on Sunday so I'd get half day off a week if I was lucky and I was easily working 12 hour days if not you know 15 16 hour days and there was no way out I said to him like really like I can't do all these hours he's like well you have to you've got no choice otherwise I'll take all your salary or something you know whatever and I was like oh this is nonsense and he also got all the all the people in the school to go against me so he'd spoken to all the teachers and said not the Western people, the Indonesian staff. Oh, sorry. There you go. It was in Indonesia. I love Indonesia. I'm still very connected to it, by the way. This is just a one-off story. So the staff wouldn't speak to me. They wouldn't engage with me. We used to come in, the other teacher and I used to come in every day singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. We taught them all the harmonies and everything. It was amazing. It was so much fun. There's this beautiful sort of community. And then just overnight, 
faces down, they wouldn't look at me because I was told they'd lose their job if they talked to me because I was this sort of evil. But so I sort of bravely had to sort of, you know, face and go in every day. And it was just ridiculous. I wasn't enjoying it. I couldn't go out. What I couldn't was, leave for the weekend. Call, I mean, obviously the threat of losing your job was causing you to keep going. Well, I was green, right? Like I didn't know what that meant. Like I didn't know what I was going to do. I had like, I only had the money that I'd been earning while I was there. So that was it. And yeah, I didn't know what to do. So I asked a lot of people their opinion, people at different schools. And they're like, well, there's nothing really you can do. He can do anything, but we can smuggle you out if you want. Like if you want to get out, then we can get you on a boat and get you out of the country. I'm like, yeah, but because you can't leave Indonesia unless you've got an exit stamp from the company that sponsored you. So you can turn up at the airport, but you can't leave if your company hasn't allowed you to leave. So there was this sort of need to get my passport back before I could go. And so I'd sort of asked him, I think I'd tried to do things the right way and nothing was happening. So I just said to him, look, I've got to go. My family's really sick. I need to go back and look after my family. I need to leave on the next flight. And he said, oh, okay, well, we need your passport then because we need to get your exit stamp. And so stupidly, I gave it to him. I didn't go with him to the office because I could have gone with him to the office and to the, you know, the whatever, but I was probably teaching and wouldn't have been allowed to anyway. So when I came to get the passport back, he left it till the very, very last minute and then said, oh, no, you owe me fiscal taxes. I was like, what? He's like, you owe me fiscal taxes. How much is fiscal taxes? The whole six months salary that I earned. <sighs> no. And I was so tired. <laughs> I had been working these like 18 hour days for however many months. I hadn't had time off. I was literally like deer in headlights. And when I say working, I wasn't sitting behind a desk. I was having like 20 kids in a class and maybe 10 classes a day, right? So back to back to back to back to back. I remember just sometimes walking into classes and going, it's reading time and just like putting my head on the, on the desk. So I was so tired. I couldn't think straight, let alone make rational decisions. And I just wanted to get out. So I went and got all my money. I went to the ATM to top up what it was that he wanted. And I just went, just take my money and give me my passport. And yeah, that's how I had to get out of the country. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? I got to Singapore and cause that was where I was routed through to get, to get back to Perth. And I just was so filled with gratitude. I was so filled with happiness to be out and to be clear of this evil, toxic, horrible sort of situation. And I remember just feeling so uplifted and so happy. I was just literally just in tears the whole time, but with happiness. And when I flew into Perth airport, again, I was so happy to be there. I just wanted to kiss the ground. I was like, oh, I love Australia, my home country. I'm here, like, you know, away from this horrible, evil toxicity. I was so happy. I went through customs and they were like, where have you been? I was like, Indonesia, I'm so happy to be home. I love my country. Oh, because I was just so emotional and happy. They thought I had drugs on me. So I had definitely like a, a full drug testing like they're like oh we need to take samples of your clothes and we need to do examination so I was like what the fuck I'm just having to be home <laughs> it was pretty funny well not really yeah. yeah talk about talk about growing up when you're 21 holy Night. yeah I mean, yeah it was, has there been was that just like a clean break from from that job yeah well the minute I handed the money over and I got my passport back I was at the airport and I was gone and that was it but I mean I came back I went back, I traveled back later on and, and said hello to people because I left legally. I was never not allowed to go back into the country. But yeah, I've continued ties with Indonesia. I love that country. I speak the language. I'm very involved in life up in Ubud, which is in Bali, what the east on the east side of the island. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful country and beautiful people, beautiful culture. I just happen to get an asshole. And I guess there's assholes in every country, there's assholes in every culture, there's assholes in every, you know, city. I just happen to get one, unfortunately. So yeah, but I mean, it sort of taught me a lot, taught me a lot about standing up for myself and doing what I wanted to be doing and, and saying no, uh, walking away, even if it did mean six months salary, you know, it was just like, just get out. I mean, I guess I could have gone to the Australian consulate or high commission and got assistance, but I was just like, no, nah, I just want to go. No, I mean, at some point it is really just worth it to cut your losses and just mm. go. Oh, in retrospect, I should have gone to the high commission, um, <laughs> but you know, yeah, you live, you learn. But I mean, it teaches you, it teaches you to have, to be able to look at things from all sides. I mean, not one person in all the people that I sought advice from told me to go to the high commission. So, and which is, I don't know, do you have the same thing over there? Like the, it's the consulate general or like the embassy. Yeah. You've got yeah. like a diplomatic sort of 
representation in a different country. Yeah. Yeah, but it also depends on which country you're in and what you've done and all that kind of stuff. So there's some sort of, there's a home base for representation for sure. Yeah. Well, in this case, basically it was in my contract that if I broke my contract, I was due for fiscal taxes and fiscal taxes were whatever the proprietor deemed appropriate. So by law, he could do that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not what the law was intending, but, <laughs> but anyway, you do learn to grow up. You do learn to very quickly just go, right, well, that was a shitty situation. <laughs> what have I learned from that? What am I doing next time? What am I, am I reading the fine print of the contract that I've signed? Yes. Do I know whether my passport is mine or not? Yes. Am I ever going to be in a situation where I have to wait on somebody else to get me an exit stamp again? No. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. Well, I mean, but those are very important lessons to learn. Very important. Well, and it's a lesson that came back to bite, well, not to bite me in the bum, but that I, it, like 10 years later, I was in Dubai and a similar thing happened where my visa was in progress. And I said to the people who I was working for, listen, I don't want to be held up at the airport and not allowed to go home because this, this visa is in progress. I don't think I can leave with a visa in progress. Can you please check? Oh, you're being paranoid. I said, no, no, I'm not being paranoid. I got blackmailed when I was like 10 years ago. I check these things now. Can you please call the office and make sure blah, blah, because I was the first teacher leaving on this new visa system. And guess what? Couldn't leave. Red lights go on. That's it. There's an illegal alien trying to leave the country. I got escorted away by police and thrown into the bloody, you know, whatever it was, lock up. My bags had to come off the plane. There was like a full sort of like brr, brr, alert at the airport. Oh my God. I'm like, I've learned this lesson already. Why am I having to go through it again? Like um, I was, it was so funny. I was sitting in the thing just going, you know, seriously, do I look like I've been, I mean, I have that same thought of like, I have done this before. Why are we doing this again? What is going on? Yeah. It happens in relationships, it happens in finances, it happens in travel and all this kind of stuff. And I think at some point, yeah, it might happen again. Like you, history might repeat itself, but there are so many things that you can learn every time you go through it, if it happens again, you know? Absolutely. Oh, I mean, this time, because I'd said to the people at my work this time, like, no, I've had visa issues before. I know that this might be a problem. Can you please check? Then I went to my boss and said, listen, the girls in the front office, I have asked them now three times and they're saying, don't worry, you're paranoid. Here's the history. This is why I'm paranoid, if you call it paranoid. I don't want this to happen again. I need to be back in Perth by this date because I'm starting a new position as the head of the department. I need to induct all the new people. This is a responsibility that is you know, really rare and I want to take it up. So I need to be able to leave on this date. I do not want to know. I don't want to hear when I get to the airport that I can't leave. He's like, oh, stop being paranoid. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. So when I was detained as an illegal alien, I was allowed one phone call. Guess who I called? <laughs> I was like, hey, so guess all that paranoia said I didn't really pay off, did it? And he's like, oh, shit. So he comes down to the airport, you know, with like bribes, trying to get me through, trying to get me onto the plane. And the police are just like, no, nah, you need the exit stamp. And he's like, but like I'm paying you 30 times what the exit stamp is worth. All you have to do is go. They'll give it to you. I'm her company. I'm the boss. Here's the company. Here's the company registration. I want her to leave. I'm happy for her to leave. I'm giving her permission to leave. Let me pay you money so she can leave. No, you have to go to the office on Monday. Oh. I'm looking at him going, seriously, dude? And, he's, and, <laughs> and because I'd done all the prep work, which I hadn't done in Indonesia, do you know what I mean? Like the second time round, it was like, and what are you going to do about it? This is an academic position that I'm not going to be able to attend on the first day. This is the whole reason I'm leaving this country on the fucking day. It's like, oh, okay, how does a first class ticket tomorrow sound? And how about we put you up at the Hyatt? And, and I was like, and I don't have any clothes because now my bags are lost. He's like, how about we give you, a, like, you know, some money to go and buy some clothes? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I stood my ground and I, I definitely went home in style. That's all I have to say. <laughs> But yeah, you do, you learn something different the next time around. It's like the first time I was so timid. I was just like, ah, take my money, I'm gone. I just want my passport, I want to go home. Second time around, it was like, no, I'm standing my ground. I told you that I wanted these things. I told you that I needed these things. You said no, you said it was fine. It wasn't fine. Now give me what I'm worth. And I got it.
Before we get back to the conversation, I want to tell you a little bit more about today's sponsor, Moo Cards. They are the only company I've ever ordered business cards or custom printed paper goods from. In fact, if you've ever attended a concert of mine, then you've probably seen their Lux business cards on my merchandise table after the show. Every single order I've made from Moo has been so easy and quite honestly, really fun. But I'm a design nerd like that. So even if you're not a design nerd, you can select from some of their expertly designed templates. So you know you won't look like an idiot while handing somebody your flyer. Oh, and their new line of Lux paper goods gets an awesome reaction from my fans every single time. So if you've ever wanted someone to say, I get to keep this when you hand them your business card, then you should go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash moo, M-O-O. So I do marketing consulting and I just have a small handful of lovely little clients, but sometimes shit hits the fan for either of us, right? And I have done my best to prepare myself legally for someone ghosting on me, right? Mm -hmm. If it happens, ghosting just means vanishing, like not responding to emails all of a sudden and not responding to invoices and all of that. The last time that it happened or threatened to happen, I was in that very same place of like, I prepared myself for this. There's a contract. Why is this happening again? Why is this happening again? And the thing that I actually learned was to give myself a break because I was blaming it on me. Like I was saying like, it's all my fault that this is happening again. I can't believe Mm. it's happening again. And when I zoomed out and realized like, actually, this has nothing to do with me. I really covered my ass in all corners of this. Mm. And now it's my responsibility to own up to that Mm. rather than just go, what? It's all my fault again. It's not my fault. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's not always happening to you. This is what I found about life in general. Like, you know, there's that sort of woe is me. It's all happening to me. I'm so sad. Poor me, poor me. It's like maybe it's just happening and it's just happening because it needs to happen to people around you and you just happen to be there and help them through a certain thing. Do you know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly what I came out with was that this has nothing to do with me. Hmm. I just was in the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Well, you just happened to be there while it was happening to someone else and, and exactly. you dealt with it and you moved on. I mean, I know with the visa situation, that changed the whole visa process for, the, for that school. They, they worked it out the, with me the wrong way, obviously. The girls, I mean, I had to go in and write an incident report because you know, the company was out thousands of dollars having to try and get me home on the next possible flight on first class, blah, 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 blah. So I had to go in and write an incident report the next day and the girls that said that they'd called the office and everything was fine, they were, in, they were in there having to sort of answer for themselves. And I said, I asked you to call. Did you call? And they said, no. And I said, but you told me that you had. Yes. Why? Because we thought it would be okay. Really? <laughs> so then that spurred a whole sort of cultural training set, you know, like in their culture, our culture, you know, if you say yes, it means no. If you say, do you know what I mean? Like that whole sort of misunderstanding and, how, and what's okay in their culture, what's okay in our culture. And then having to, because these two cultures are having to work together. So, you know, much deeper cultural understanding of, of, of why things go awry, right? So, yeah, I mean, I guess that whole situation, if you, if you pull it apart, yeah, okay, so I missed out on the first day, but I still got to hold the position. I did get flown home in first class and got some nice new clothes and spent the night at a very swanky hotel, so exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it was a huge, huge process for that school to learn, you know, just not just around the visa and the rules and the regulations of the visas, but also around you know, the cultural training for the people there as well. So it's not always about why is it happening to me? It's, it's often, you know, why is it happening? We'll stop, you know, what lesson is there in it? I think there's a lesson in everything. Oh, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think that that's something that anytime something bad, quote unquote, happens to you or happens to us, and like, it's such a great reminder to pop yourself out of that victim mentality. Totally. And just go, regardless what is yeah. there to learn? Like, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. What do we need to do to re- not have this happen again, you know? Yeah, and it's all about the reflective style, and that's something that I teach and have taught in many different classrooms. Actually, you want a bravery story. 
I had this one, I was teaching the reflective cycle, which is revolutionizes people's lives, right? So you look at a situation, you look at what happened, what were the, what was, what was the environment? Why did it happen? You don't just look at, it's not like, oh, I won't do that again. It's like, well, what was the precursors to getting there? And then how can I prevent the precursors? It's not just what actually happened, but the sort of environment or the situation or whatever it was beforehand that sort of got me there. So that next time if this situation comes up again, I can prevent it from happening, not just the action, but the actual sort of the pre-work that ends up in the action. Anyway, so it's, it's, it's a sort of, it's a process and you learn it. And over weeks you hold journals and you look at every single thing that happens in your life. So whether it's good or bad, or good or not so good, and then how you can repeat the good stuff or how you can sort of not, not so much repeat the not so good stuff. So it's this uh, cycle and you do it over weeks. And the stories that come up through the students are just phenomenal. Like they have you in tears. And one guy, I still got it, one guy said that the lesson had given him the bravery to step out and come out of the closet and, and tell his family that he was gay. I was like, what the fuck? He's like, when he came in, he didn't want to do group work. He was really quiet. He was really sullen. He didn't want to speak to anyone. And over the course of this, whatever it was, 10 weeks journal writing, we had to analyse everything that was going on in his life. He realised that all the areas of his life that he was sort of hiding away in, it was because he couldn't be himself. He couldn't express who he really was. Wow. And so with the, bra- with the sort of confidence that came from journaling and understanding that if, if he was just able to step out in this way, then he could step out in that way. And if that wasn't preventing him, then this wouldn't prevent him. He just sort of unlocked all this shit that was going on in his life it was all because he couldn't be himself. So his social life was suffering, his academic life was suffering because he didn't want to be ridiculed because people, oh, are you gay or something? Like, you know, because he wasn't out there. So it was wow. just, it was, I read this thing and just that, oh, I burst into tears and said, oh my God, how brave. He's come out to me first. Like this is, he's like, this, that's it. Stuff has to change. I'm coming out. I'm telling my family. I'm telling my friends. No more hiding. This is me. This I'm is like. Double arm goosebumps right now. Right. It's, it's like, so great. Yeah. Beautiful. And all just from the process of reflection is so, oh powerful really really powerful stuff oh, so wow yeah. so, mm. so ex- explain that a little bit further like explain that process a little bit further you have to analyze like what happened and then why it happened so what happened was it good or bad yeah why was it good or bad so like let's do okay let's do something really simple like falling off a bike right okay, okay. so what happened i fell off my bike was it good or bad well it was bad why was it bad well because i hurt myself and i injured myself Okay. So why did it happen? Well, because I took my, uh, cause I was checking my mobile phone and I didn't see a pothole. And so I fell into the pothole. Okay. So if faced with that situation again, what would you do differently? So, oh, well, I wouldn't be on my phone. But, okay. So take a step back further. Why have you even got your phone in a place that you can see it when you're riding right. your bicycle? Yes. So it's not just like I won't look at my phone. It's like, well, how about I remove the need to even be tempted by my phone? So I know that when I'm on my bike, I'm always going to stay focused. Yeah. So then what are you going to do to prevent this situation happening again? Or if it's a good thing, what am I going to do to make sure that this thing happens again? So the crux of that is I'm always, if I'm riding my bike, I'm going to leave my phone in my bag so that I can't access it. And then I know that I'm not going to lose concentration because of my phone. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I see it. So, and it's the same with when something good happens. It's like, okay, so what's something that's just good happened to me just recently? Okay, so I've just been invited to be the keynote speaker at a conference in Samoa and also to deliver a bunch of teacher training workshops. Yes, is it good or bad? It's great. Why is it good? Because it's doing something I really love. It's doing the whole keynote speaking thing. It's the workshops and the teacher training. It's traveling. It's all the things that I love in one simple package. Why did it happen? Because a year ago I was open to a possibility where a friend of mine said, Hey, I've got money for a babysitter. I can give that to you for an airfare. If you come and look after my kids for two weeks, I think, because I've got to go traveling and my company will allow me to pay for a babysitter. So if that means getting you over here so you can look after my kids, happy days. Do you want a free trip to Samoa? I'm like, Fuck yeah. so I went to Samoa and while I was there, I was like, I'm a bit bored what am I going to do? I'll do my annual giving back thing. So I went and did a workshop at a primary school. I went and did a workshop at the university. I went and did a workshop at the ministry of education. 
oh, freebies. I was just bored. I was on holidays and it's thought, oh, I'll just go and have some fun and go and do what I love doing, which is talking and being an idiot and, you know, talking about teaching and learning and inspiring people and getting them all amped up about how education can actually be fun. And so a year later, they're like, would you like an all expenses paid trip to come and speak to her? I was like, um, yeah, I think I would. So why did it happen? Because I gave of myself when I was there because yeah. I was open to possibilities and I was like, I'm just going to do what I love doing and forget where the money's coming from. I'm on holidays anyway. I'm just going to do what I love doing. So why did that opportunity come to me? Well, and even I- further, you're going to say yes to anything that feels good, which is going exactly. to and being with your friends. Exactly. So be open to possibilities. Just say yes when you think, fuck, that's a bit nuts. Oh, I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care. If it makes you feel expansive and fun. And when you do things that light you up, when you do things that make you feel good. And for me, that's volunteering my time, going down to a primary school and teaching the teachers some games, like on how to get the kids sort of engaged and fun and talking and all the rest of it. That stuff lights me up. It makes me feel really good. People are like, are you fucking nuts? You're on holiday. Just read a book. I'm like, yeah, nah, I get bored. <laughs> that to me is holiday. It does. It makes me feel good. Like giving it back and just going, no, I didn't get paid for it. But, you know, I mean, I know I have to make a living, but these people can't afford it, right? this small beach school in the middle of nowhere, you know, they're not going to ever have the money to employ an international person to come and do teacher training. So fuck it. I'm just going to give it away. And you do that. And the sun comes out of you. Do you know what I mean? Like the sun sun's out of your ass. Everyone looks at you and goes, fuck, look at her. She's just all, she's doing this in her free time. Like what the fuck? She must really love it. And I do the truth. And that's what they said. The reason we're inviting you is because of the reports that we had from the Vaila beach school. There it is. So that's the reflective loop. You know, when something good happens, break it down. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to be open to keynote invitations. It's like, no, I'm just going to go over and be myself and do what I do and let myself do the stuff that lights me up. Because when it lights me up, people can see that. And it's not fake. And it's not like I'm paid to be here and pay me for a workshop. I mean, of course, that's part of my job. But, and I love doing my job and I love being paid for my job. But when I can give freely, because that's part of my sort of service, it's part of my business, my whole business is based on that, that whole giving back thing. I do it every year then good things come to you. Your reputation builds. And that's the sort of business, that sort of heart-centered, soul-centered sort of business. That's what I want to create. It's a, it's a business based on who I am and what I do best and, and referrals coming back in from awesome sort of experiences like that. So you know. I have been, one of my goals, I've been doing vision casting for my year. And one of the things that I've been really trying to focus on is pulling generosity into the core of everything I'm doing. So yeah. business wise, artistically, yeah, just generosity in that center because it's been on the outside. It's been the thing that I've been like looking for, but it's not, it hasn't worked its way down into the really nitty gritty of why, you know, I think it's, it's very close to the core right now as it is. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing that play out in this next year. So how does that, because I clearly you do that also, how does that play out in a logistical way with your business and with the stuff that you do? Well, service is at the core of what I do. One of my core desired feelings is, is being of service, so helping people like that. The feeling I get when I get a client that comes to me in absolute chaos going, oh, I've got this course. I know I can get it out of my head. Oh, I'm, uh, I've been putting it off the year. Oh, I've got to do it. My business isn't going to go forward unless I can leverage my time. Oh, like they come with this chaos and this confusion and this like sense of dread. I know I have to do it, but I don't want to. And they leave me six months later going, or six weeks or however long it takes, going, oh my God, we've nailed it. I just did this workshop. My clients were like, oh my God, you're the best teacher ever. And you know, like, I didn't, I, I saw myself standing on stage, giving these presentations going, you're nailing it. They're laughing at your jokes. Oh my God. And I hear that. And I see that. And it just, something inside me surges. And I'm like, yes, like that's what I'm here for. This is my superpower. This is how I help people. I know that people have, can go leaps and bounds when they work from, with me. And that, whether that happens in a paid sense or in a service sense, like in a volunteer sense, the satisfaction is the same. In fact, when I get that reaction and I've done it on a volunteer basis, it's an even stronger reaction, which yeah. is why I've got this giving back program that I do every year. So every year I find a school that needs help and I go and I give freely. So this year or next year is probably going to be somewhere again because I'm going to be out there doing the keynotes and whatever. So I'll probably go and find another school and do some teacher training workshops there just for free because this is what I do. So that is embedded in my business. I've also got a library of resources online and the starter pack, which is sort of like all the juicy stuff that you need to know if you're going to be putting your content online. 
the proceeds from that also go to these teacher training trips. So it's not about flying me out there, but it's more about the resources that they need when they're there. So do they need help with teacher training? Do they need a piece of technology that's integral to getting more communication from their, from their students, or whatever. It's not so much about using the money to give them resources that otherwise they could have worked out how to do for themselves, but it's more about providing resources that they can then use a hundred times over and adapt for their own use. So things like graded reader sets, which is where you get sort of stories like Romeo and Juliet, but they're made in very, very simple language so that kids can learn the English in them and learn it in a very integrated sense. They can move between the levels and they come with audio. So like if there's blind or deaf kids in the school, then they can use the, the others. So these sorts of teaching resources and then use it, showing teachers how to use them and how to exploit them and how to get hours and hours and hours of lessons out of one book and keep it really interesting and engaging. That's the sort of skill then, if you can get them that initial resource, they can go and then get their own texts and, and do that with their own texts. And then it improves the whole teaching of the, in, the, in the classrooms, in the school. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's completely weaved into my business because it's not only the, the library of resources that I've got online, obviously they're for sale, but a portion of those proceeds go to these teacher training trips. So helping schools get better at, at delivering based on the stuff that they've got. So if they need props or whatever, it comes from the money that I earn from that part of my business. So I do it at least once a year. It comes from my income. There's obviously I fly myself over there and I give my time freely. That's not taken into account either. But doing that just pumps me up. And I know that I get to do that once a year. It's on my website. It's freely there. It's, you know, when you go and buy something from the starter pack, you know that the money is going to that cause. So, yeah, and I guess that's just the cycle, right? That makes me feel better. It expands me. It makes me feel good about myself and about the sort of, I guess, the real change that I'm helping to create in the world. You know, my tags create real change. So I'm really helping to change the lives of those teachers and those students in schools that otherwise wouldn't have had that training. So it's a cycle, right? It just feeds me. Like the more I do, the more it feeds me, the more change it creates, the more it feeds me. And I guess it's all about knowing what your core desired feeling is. For me, it's being of service and helping people. So helping them pass something that they wouldn't have been able to do without me. And so my whole business model is based on it. It feels good. It feels really yeah. good. Nine to five. And also, cool. like on the flip side, it feels really shitty when you can't do that. Yeah. And that for me was nine to fiving. Yeah. That to me was turning up. I'm not saying there's anything wrong to nine to five and anyone listening who's in a nine to five, kudos to you, man. I'm not, I'm not ditching it. But for me, there was the more and more service I gave in my nine to five, the more I was treated like a number, you know, I was giving 150, 200% to these schools. I was going way above and beyond trying to help, help, help all the time. Did my wage increase? No. Did my satisfaction increase? No. Did the amount of appreciation I get increase? Nah. (laughs) So that's why you asked before, right at the start of the interview, what made you change? What made you think I'm going to be brave and I'm going to step away? It was that. It was, I worked myself into the ground to the point where I ended up with multiple organ failure and nearly died. What for? A company who couldn't have given two shits. I mean, <laughs> if they're listening, sorry, maybe you do give two shits. But <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what am I doing this for? Like the, the amount of myself that I'm pouring into these companies is, is not commiserate with what I get out of it. Now that I'm working on my own, I get to sculpt a business around what I love doing, about what fires me up, about really what makes me feel good at the end of the day. And that's what I fill my day with. So the decision to move from corporate over to myself was that realisation that I was never going to get what I wanted out of working nine to five. And what I wanted was to be able to give freely and do things that lifted me up. And it's just not possible when you're working in a nine to five because you don't end up with the satisfaction. You don't get the reward. I mean, you get the reward from doing the service, but it's just, it's different when you're doing it for yourself and that's your business so that you dictate the amount of time that you spend and the hours that you give and whatever. So yeah, that was, that was the turning. When that generosity fully lives inside of you, as opposed to someone else owning part of your generosity, it just, it, it is a complete game changer. Isn't it? When you're in control of it. And I think it's also like, I learn a lot about, do you know the five languages of love? Mm-hmm. I yeah, do. So time, touch, words, gifts, and service. Yeah. Right? Oh. Service, like doing things that you know people need, doing things that you know will help people. That is like, shout it from the rooftops, baby. Like that is my, like when I realized that, I was like, ah, oh, that's why I hate buying birthday presents for people and I'd prefer to cook them a massive pot of chicken soup because they're sick. <laughs> 
you know what I mean? Like when that penny dropped, I was like, oh, that's why. Like when I, in my relationships, uh, you know, family, partners, friends, I'm always the one going, oh, shit, I didn't buy them a birthday present again. But then I think, but, you know, I do lots of stuff for them. Like <laughs> I'll go and pick them up if they need, like, you know, driving somewhere or I'll take them something when I know they're sick or, you know, I'll cook something for them if I, if I know that they're, you know, busy or whatever. Like they're the things that I do and come naturally and that make me feel really good when I'm doing it. And then I was like, oh, that's actually a way of expressing love. I never got that. And when you understand that and then you understand the people around you, like, oh, so they're a gift giver. That's why they don't do things I need. <laughs> Right, like doesn't it explain all of your previous relationships? Like all oh, yeah. you know, friend relationships. And it's like, ah, that's why it was always really like we felt really weirdly unbalanced, but it was probably actually totally imbalanced because they were doing the things that felt good for them. You're doing the things that feel good for you, but if you're not understanding each other's languages of love, then you you know, sort of speaking different languages at one another. So yeah, so when you get to nail that gift like that, how do you express love? How do you ex- how do you feel love? For me, it was service and I realized that that's my core desired feeling, which then comes right through my business. So I guess when you nail that, then like sky's the limit. You just start flying. And I guess okay, that's, so for the yeah. final question, which is kind yeah. of a doozy one, so I, I'm aware of what I'm about to ask. How do you find your core desired feeling? Oh, you know, I mean, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of Danielle Laporte and she has the yep. Desire Map book. But how did you come across that for yourself? I've been a fan of Danielle Laporte's for a long time. I haven't ever really gone deep dive into a lot of her stuff, but I've definitely, I've got a little inspiration thing that pops on my phone every day and I've done some readings. I've worked with a lot of personal development people, spiritual, like healers, you know, call it what you will, but, you know, people who help you on your journey and help you unravel the bits and the knots and the pieces that don't sort of help you move forward in life in general. And one of the healers I'm working with at the moment, she's just an amazing woman. She talks about core desired feelings. She's been talking about them for 20 years. And she has a method that takes you through looking back to your childhood and, and realizing the things that really gave you joy and then distilling the emotions that are in that and, and why those values were set so early on. So I think there's, it, there's not like a worksheet you can do. There's not like a single way that you arrive at it. I think like you know, going back to your childhood is one way circling a whole heap of words on a page is another way. I think at the end of the day, if it's something that you're focused on and that you're continually looking for evidence for, like for me, if I look in my childhood, I look in high school, I look at my university years, and then I look at the sorts of things that I was always doing when I was away on all these traveling trips. Like I set up, you know, calendars and sold them for the disabled school. So the disabled school would have resources. I'm you know, always doing voluntary stuff, always being part of like, you know, Apex Club, like Rotary Club, you know, like these sort of service organisations. I was on, you know, in high school, I was part of the Amnesty International groups, you know, giving time, giving service, you know. I'm the one that's baking the cakes and getting out there and fundraising for, you know, the kids in Africa that don't have eyeballs or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, <sighs> If I look through my whole life, that, that is the single thing that to me again and again and again, it's just getting out there and giving. And that's, I guess, one of the questions in your interview sheet was, who's your hero? And my hero is my grand. My grand passed away now some years ago, but she was that person. She was that person in the community where it didn't matter what happened, you could go to her and you'd come out fixed. You know, like if you were sad, if you were going through a divorce, if you were ill, you know, whatever, you'd come in, you'd get mollied and then you'd go out again and, and, you know, you'd be good. And she was that pinnacle of the community. I mean, there's now a park bench in her memory in the town. And I guess, I don't know whether I learnt the service thing from her, but I, I guess I watched her as a, as a small kid growing up and, and really, I guess, revered that or appreciated it, loved it, looked up to it and thought, wow, like that's the sort of woman I want to grow up to be. And so I guess it's just filtered through my whole life. So yeah, I don't think there's one way of finding it. I think there's a lot of different methods. There's a lot of different people you can work with, but really it's looking at, if you look through your whole life, what are the things that bring you joy? You know, for my partner, it's, it's feeling free. It's feeling adventurous. It's feeling daring. It's doing things that give him an adrenaline rush. I sort of like doing those things, but I give him the heebie-jeebies and I'm like, oh, it's fun, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> yeah, but for him, he could do that literally all day, every day, because it lights him up, this sort of rush. So it's, it's different for everyone. For me, baking cakes for someone and caking them over, that gives me a rush. Like That would be torturous 
hellish nightmare for him to have to bake cupcakes, you know, all of your cooked chicken soup. Do you know what I mean? It lights me up. So go back to the things that light you up. Work out what is it that makes you light up and then go out there and bloody Google, you know, like, fine, like, how do, how do I work out my core design feelings? There is so many people that can help you do that. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great yeah. tool to have. Like, once you have that, it's a yeah. really wonderful tool to have. So Especially if you're in small business or especially if you're just in life in general and wanting to divine joy out of the world, then you just work out how to put more and more and more and more of that into your life because the more you do, the more it lights you up. And the more it lights you up, the more the world sees this beautiful package of gifts that you've got to give. So, yeah. 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 Oh, this has been wonderful. Oh. Thank you so much for joining us. You are very welcome. It's been fun. Can you tell I like storytelling? (laughs) I can. I love it. Maria's sense of generosity and desire to give back through her business and work as an entrepreneur, that sunk deeply into my psyche after she and I hung up the phone. It inspired me to get really serious about incorporating my own generosity into my business model as a writer, teaching artist, and singer-songwriter in 2017. So you'll notice as the weeks unfold and weeks and months unfold in 2017, generosity is going to be a large core value in my own life and my business specifically. So because I've gained so much from focusing on this sense of generosity through conversations with Maria and also with Barry Tesler from an earlier episode, I want to challenge you to do the same. How can you create a structure in your life or in your business in which supports generosity and playfulness? Not just being generous, but how can you create a system or a policy for your budget that can support the generosity and playfulness that you want to have in your own life? How can you use the gifts and resources that you already have to give back to the people and places that you cherish? We, Maria and I, would love to hear all about your favorite parts of today's Bare Naked Bravery conversation. You can find Maria Doyle and myself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. Go ahead and tag us so that we can cheer you on and see what you're up to. And that's our show this week. Thank you again for listening. We've put all the links in the show notes for today's episode, so be sure to visit us online for all of that. Just visit barenakedbravery.com. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it for you, please give us a review and rate the show in your iTunes desktop app or on your podcast app on your phone. Not only did Joe from iTunes say the show is talented and inspiring, but he gave us five stars and added, Emily is a very talented interview and I sincerely appreciate her passion and personality that exudes through every episode. Thank you so much, Joe, for listening to the show. We really, really appreciate all that you bring to Bare Naked Brain bravery and all of the bravery that exists in the world. We really appreciate you. I do not take it lightly that you all have noticed that your exuberance or lack of it will always shine through your work and it helps the show out a lot and it helps the bravery that we talk about every week to get spread further and further. And it helps us out a lot more than it is a hassle for you. So just go ahead and do it. Send an email, send a tweet, share it with a friend. You are a part of all of this bravery. If you are digging the music in today's episode, that's because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique soundtracks. To find out more about all the artists, musicians, and other sponsors of the show, please visit barenakedbravery.com forward slash sponsors. I'm really looking forward to being with you next week. We have some really awesome things in store for you. And until then, I have one message for you. It's this. Be yourself. Be vulnerable. Be adventurous. Be brave. Because the world needs more of your bare-naked bravery. Mm -hmm.